Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about this unit and our history with topography, for example. We started back when Penny did with a cornea scope, <laughs> you know, and you just looked at all these rings and you try to figure out what the heck's going on, and even before we had color topography. Then we got an ISIS and that kind of went on the fritz, and then we had a Keratron, and that was going on the fritz. And our practice has seven ophthalmologists. One of them is Ezra McGann, you know, a cornea guy, so he's kind of fussy. So I was kind of pushing to get something that did more than topography, and some of them just wanted to get a basic topographer, because this, this unit costs obviously a little more than just getting a straight topographer. But since our laser center is not at our practice, I wanted to be able to do some kind of a wavefront analysis on patients in addition to topography. We have our techs do our refractions, and sometimes they'd be in there you know, for 10 or 15 minutes trying to figure out a refraction because they're really not very good at it, and we didn't have a good auto refractor. So the reason we, I finally convinced them that we would get one of these is because it's got a great auto refractor, and you don't have to use it for anything other than an auto refraction if you want. You can sit somebody down in like 15 seconds get a very accurate auto refraction, just spits out on a little tape. And so everybody that comes into our office that's either a new patient or is likely to need a change in refraction gets an auto refraction. And then um, we do topography now on all our cataract patients. And everybody says, well, how do you do that? You can't bill for that. And that's the good news. You can't bill for that. You don't want to bill for that. Because if you bill for it, Medicare might pay you $25. So what we tell our cataract patients now, and we have never had anybody object to this, we have them sign an ABN, an Advanced Beneficiary Notice. We tell them that we need the topography to do a better job on their cataract surgery. I personally believe that that's true. A lot of people probably don't pay any attention to it. So if you're not going to do anything about their astigmatism, you really don't need the topography. But I like to show them if they have astigmatism, what we can do about it, and start introducing the options of a toric IOL or liberal relaxing incisions. Or if they have no astigmatism, I show them their map and I say, oh my God, are you lucky? You don't have any astigmatism. You know, and astigmatism is such a bad word. It comes from stigmata, the stigmata of Christ. People come in and they say they have astigmatism, they think you know, they've got some horrible disease or something. So if you can show them a map that shows they have no astigmatism, they're happy to pay 90 bucks for it. That's what we charge them. We charge $90 for a topography on all the cataract patients, and they sign an ABN, and on that ABN it tells them, we are not going to bill Medicare for this because it's not reimbursable to Medicare because you don't have post-keratoplasty astigmatism where you could bill Medicare. So you can't bill for topography if it's a routine case, and that's good. I hope it stays that way forever, because when they do pay, they don't pay you enough anyway. So we've added revenue to our practice just by doing topography on all, and some of the guys in our practice actually don't do much about astigmatism. They still do the topography, and if a patient really feels that they want their astigmatism corrected, they'll refer them to me, you know, to do either a toric IRL or, or, or LRIs. So, we put this unit in the hallway of our practice. We didn't have an extra room because we've got instruments all over the place. So we have a hallway that was just had a little, little bench on it. We took the bench down, turned the overhead lights off so it's a little bit dark there, so you can kind of get a little bit of a pupil reading. And that's where the unit is, so it's not taking up any space. It's not in a separate room, and it's easy access <clears throat> as patients come in. They just get this first. If they're going to have cataract surgery, they get it. If they're a post-LASIK patient, they get it. If they need a refraction, they get it. So this is how we use it. Fast auto refractor. We're doing the topography. I mentioned the fee, you know, 90 bucks for doing that. We get wavefront measurements that are useful in telling them whether they need custom LASIK versus conventional LASIK. We get an idea of their pupil size, mesopic and photopic. And you can actually take a picture because we don't have a really good anterior segment camera in our office. You can take a picture of like a pterygium with this thing, and I'll show you that later. So this is me now, my pre-op cataract evaluation. I had cataract surgery three years ago. Any of you had cataract surgery? It is a very interesting experience <laughs> to be lying there waiting, you know. And a good friend of mine did it, Barry Seibel. And I said, Barry, I don't care what happens. Don't break my capsule. So. I'm hearing the sound. I know when the ultrasound's going on, and then I hear it says, capsule polish. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> I didn't even want him to polish the capsule. I wanted to stay away from the capsule. He said it had too much smuts on it, so he polished my capsule. Anyway, it went fine. So 
I wanted no multifocal, no crystal lens. I wanted really good vision, and I had a little bit of astigmatism. I didn't want any increased chance of glare, uh, and I don't mind wearing glasses. I mean, I passed my driver's test two weeks ago without glasses. I have 20, 30, and 20, 40, but I wear my glasses all the time because I like to see up close. I like to see the speedometer on the car, tune the radio, and all that stuff, so I didn't care about wearing glasses. So this unit helped evaluate me. There's me with all my different kinds of glasses, you know, ski goggles, glasses, Polaroid glasses, transition lenses. I'm a, I'm a bad, bad apple for our optician because I don't pay anything for the glasses, you know. But I make her give me all these glasses. So here's my pre-op wavefront in my right eye. It shows that I have a little with the rule astigmatism and not enough to really warrant a uh, toric lens. I had about one and a half. And I figured Barry can do some very conservative LRIs. If he gets rid of half of it or three quarters of it, I was going to be happy. As you know, with the rule, astigmatism gets better as you get older anyway. So if I live to be 100, I'll have no astigmatism, even if he does nothing, because my astigmatism keeps going down. So um, my total spherical aberration was positive 0.45. That's typical. You know, we're all going to have that happen. The neutrality that we all have when we're young where the corneal spherical aberration and the lenticular spherical aberration neutralizes each other, you lose that as you get older and you start getting more and more positive spherical aberration. So I knew when I saw that I had positive 0.4 that I definitely wanted to have a, an aspheric implant. And so I, I did choose to have an aspheric implant. There's the pupil sizes. And here's the, the post-op, uncorrected vision is 2030, Plano minus a quarter. I think I'm actually Plano minus a half now. And uh, my mesopic pupil size, I was happy, I had no glare. And the scale on the side here shows you the different aberrations. You can print out more than that if you want, but obviously what we're mostly interested in is coma and spherical aberration. Um, and there's the, uh, there's the auto refraction. This is my pre-op numbers, and that was my manifest refraction. So it had the cylinder just about right, 158 versus 165, you know, plus one and a quarter, plus, plus 75. Let's go to the next one. So this was a scan that I had done in Atlanta uh, after the surgery, I believe. And it shows that my total spherical aberration is now negative 0.2. Yeah, that was, uh, I think I had the surgery in August and this was in November. There's a, a minimal amount of astigmatism now. He did LRIs for one and a half a sill and I've got about a half a diopter of refractive sill and almost none. This thing also shows you the difference between corneal uh, aberrations and uh, lenticular aberrations. So I'll show you a case later where you can see the astigmatism is still in the cornea, but it was neutralized by the toric implant, and you can see that on the, on the topography. So here's all the different, if you want to see all the aberrations, you can do that. If you had a dark enough room, you could use this instrument for screening LASIK patients and measure both the mesopic pupil and the photopic pupil. All you'd have to do is actually put a black hood over their head. We could do that in our hallway, but we have a neuro-optics thing for measuring pupil size. So there's the pupil measurements. 4.63 is the mesopic pupil and 3.2. Here's the post-op Humphrey Atlas on me showing pretty much the same thing. In the Humphrey Atlas post-op corneal wavefront said I had a positive 0.13. So it didn't quite exactly agree with the Marco, but it was pretty close. But remember, uh, my pre-op number was almost 0.5, I think it was. So taking out the cataract and putting in an aspheric implant has made me very happy in terms of spherical aberration. It's actually pretty low now. And this was just to compare the readings with the uh, Humphrey versus the readings with the other one. This is all the stuff we already know. You know, your lens aberration, your corneal aberration. So when we're in, in this range in here, they kind of neutralize each other, and then all of a sudden, your spherical aberration starts going up because of the change in the lens. The corneal spherical aberration stays the same. So what's changing is our lens. So you go through this little period right around in here when you almost have none, and now I'm up in here in this range, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I think spherical, aspheric lenses are great advance, and I'm more interested in getting rid of my aberrations than I was in having a multifocal and taking the chance of having you know halos and glare. I'm sure I would end up with that. So there's the whole eye. So when you're in your 20s, these two cancel each other out, 
and you end up with very little aberrations. And then the, the uh, total aberration goes up because the lens aberration is increasing, whereas your corneal is staying basically the same. And there's a lot of information in the literature about this. This is, this is a study that showed that the mean average corneal spherical aberration for a point uh, for a six millimeter pupil is positive 2.27. That's why, you know, the different implants, one of them neutralizes, the Alcon is about 0.2, and I think the uh, AMO is a little more, maybe 0.25 or 2.7 is the AMO technus uh, aspheric. A this is the scan of my left eye. This looks like pellucid. This isn't pellucid. This is because I was stupid when I was <laughs> about 20 years ago, I had my friend Rick Villasenor do AK on me. I used to have four diopters of with the rule astigmatism. So he did a pair of AK incisions and we had me down to none. So for a while I was happy. My left eye was my good eye. I was like 2025 uncorrected. And then what, what arcuate keratectomy does is just like RK, it has a progressive effect over time. Just like you have progressive hyperopic shift in RK patients, your AK incisions, different than limbal relaxing incisions, which I think heal better because they're near the limbus, AK incisions have a progressive effect over time. So I went from four diopters of with the rule to Plano, and now I have about three and a half against the rule, because it's about 15 years since my AK. So this is this weird looking map. This is why I would definitely not want a multifocal. I haven't had surgery on my left eye yet, but I have about three diopters of astigmatism in this eye. Uh, I think one of these readings will show it to you, maybe the next one. This is just all this stuff about how it works. Here's some of the uh, literature that's in support of the fact that these aspheric lenses actually work. This was a study in 2008 showing you the difference in corneal spherical aberration in eyes that had an aspheric lens, and the differences were statistically significant no matter what the pupil size was. Obviously, if you have a really tiny pupil, none of this stuff makes any difference. If you're walking around with a three millimeter pupil, you'll have almost no aberrations. You're only gonna have a problem if your pupils are fairly large. Mine are about five or five and a half in the dark. Here's an analysis of benefits. Again, I'm not gonna bore you with this, but there's plenty of stuff in the literature that I think justifies a decision to put an aspheric implant in rather than the standard monofocal. And here's another article. This was an interesting one by Howard Fine's group. One of the few articles where they actually tried to match the lens with the preoperative spherical aberration number. Most of us just put in a standard lens, either use an Alcon or an AMO. But in this study, they tried to look at the amount of preoperative uh, positive spherical aberration and choose the implant based on the amount of aberration. So some eyes had a Bosch and Loam, which doesn't add any negative. Some had a Technus, which adds 2.27, and some had a, an, a, uh, an Alcon, which adds 0.20. This, this is their final conclusions, by the way, back here. So if you have this unit, you could actually do that. Or if you have any method of measuring corneal spherical aberration and separating it from total aberration, most of the instruments like the LADAR wave, for example, or the, or the VISX, that's giving you the total spherical aberration. It's not telling you how much spherical aberration is in the cornea, but the NIDEC will separate them for you. So this is a patient that had myopic LASIK uh, previously, which we do expect to increase the positive spherical aberration because you've got this big steep zone out in the periphery. Um, it had a nuclear cataract, so her corneal spherical aberration was positive 0.2. .2. And uh, the Alcon is, you know, you can calculate all this stuff on the, on the ASCRS website on post-LASIK patients. So a post-LASIK patient or post-RK patient that was myopic, if they had myopic LASIK, myopic PRK, or RK, they were myopic before, they're going to have higher than normal positive spherical aberration. So for sure, you want to use an aspheric lens in all those people. And the challenge, of course, is getting the power right. And the ASCRS website is really great for helping you because you can, if you have all the data, you can get eight different calculations. If you all use the ASCRS website, ASCRS, just go to ASCRS.org, I think it is. And on the front page, there's their uh, refractive lens calculator. You just put in all the numbers you can. If you don't have the numbers, you won't get formulas for that. 
but if it was your patient and you know the refraction and you know the map and you know the topography and you know what the K readings were before surgery and you know the post-op result, you can get eight different calculations to choose from. This is kind of how it looks. So there's me, there's this patient. That was what we had all these numbers. So the patient was minus nine pre-op with a little bit of sill. Those were the pre-op Ks. Ended up minus one, so there was an eighth optic refractive change. This is the atlas. If you have an atlas, you can get the readings. You, you just put, pull that up at zero, one, two, three. This is what Doug Koch and Warren Hill think we should use on all RK patients. They basically have given up on any of the historical data, and they just use zero, one, two, and three on an atlas to calculate the power. Then you put in your IOL master numbers, you put in your axial length, the AC depth, you target what the refraction is, and then you hit calculate and it'll give you all the formulas. So here you go. So we got three, four, seven, almost 10 formulas now. So the question is, which one is the right one? You know, and that's where it's, you might as well throw a dart <laughs> to try to figure it out. So in this case, we have a variation from 19 and a half to 22 and a half almost. That's not bad, that's only three. I've done this where sometimes there's a five diopter difference and then you don't know what the heck to pick. So you're just sort of flying by the seat. And what I do now with all my post LASIK patients, I show them this thing. And I say, look, this is why this is so hard. I'm not worried about taking out your cataract. I can see into your eye. We're gonna get the cataract out. The challenge is getting the right power. So I start preparing them for the fact that we could miss this a little bit. You know, we might now have to go back and do a post LASIK. I've never had to do an IOL exchange. I've always been close enough that I could touch them up with either a, a PRK or with LASIK. So I can't even remember which one we picked on this one. Pre-op minus three, positive circle average to 0.1. The Marco refraction, see how close it was to the other refraction. And there's the post-op with spherical aberration of 0.04. You can see the numbers here. This is the internal map showing that there's still some uh, internal, internal astigmatism. This is the hyperopic LASIK, which increases the negative spherical aberration. So then you don't want to put an aspheric lens in. So you just put in a standard lens or you could use that, uh, I guess you could actually use that Bosch and Lohm lens, which doesn't induce any negative spherical aberration. So we took out the, uh, used a spherical IOL, and this turned out okay. You can tell it's a, a previous hyperopic LASIK because of the steepening in the center. Here's uh, another way to, to, to do these. There's a superior LRI based on the fact that the astigmatism was asymmetrical, more astigmatism up above than down below. So I just placed one up above and it reduced it from minus 2.3 of cylinder pre-op to minus a half. So it got rid of about one and a quarter diopters of astigmatism with just a single LRI. So here's symmetrical corneal astigmatism. So you'd use a pair of, of uh, incisions. By the way, if I really want to nail this astigmatism, I prefer doing a, a toric implant. Toric implants are incredibly accurate. These LRIs are, you know, you're going to make them better usually, but you really can't count on it nailing the result. So here's an example, I guess, of a toric LRI with three and a half doctors of sill, FACO toric IOL, ended up with minus two. I think we were time for monovision in that eye. Uh, let's see, with the three and, three and a quarter doppers of corneal astigmatism, the Marco refraction plus five and a half minus four, basically. Uh, you can see the K readings and uh, the corneal cylinder. There's another one I think that I have that's a, that was a friend of mine. That's the post-op result targeted for monovision. The auto refraction, the corneal cylinder is still here but the OPD shows minimal cylinder overall. So the, the total cylinder, even though you can tell it was a toric lens to fix this because you've still got the corneal astigmatism. This is my friend that I did who had always worn glasses all his life. He's a music conductor and uh, we did toric implants on him. I just saw him about a week ago and he's like minus a quarter in each eye with no cylinder, you know, happy as can be. So here's his, here's his cylinder. There's the internal and internal and the corneal total. And he had cylinder in both eyes. We did, we did these uh, toric implants in both eyes. You've all used the calculator so you know how to do this. You just put the numbers in, calculates it, 
it figures out how much astigmatism you're getting from your incision and tells you what axis to place the lens in. That's on the Alcon website. So here he is, there's almost no cylinder now, and he's about minus a quarter. Very, that was an aspheric toric implant, by the way, and he turned out great. Here's another use of this thing. If you want to document a pterygium, here's the distortion caused by the pterygium. So it's an anterior segment photograph. Uh, it's not good enough to, and here's a dislocated implant. You can see the implant with the loop. So you can use it even for certain rudimentary ty type of photographs. It's certainly not an anterior segment camera, but you can use pictures and you can bill for this as an anterior segment photograph using just the, uh, the Marco unit for that. So anyway, we found this unit to be a, a great boon to our practice. We use it a lot. And I think um, considering that it costs a little more, you're getting a little more too. To have a combination auto refactor, topographer, and wavefront instrument all into one simple instrument. And it's very fast and the techs are, are very good at using it. Easy to train, the support from Marco has been great. Maya over there is great at showing you all the tricks that you can do with this thing. If you have time, spend a few minutes with Maya over there. She's great at it. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any questions about it. Great. Thanks a lot for your attention.